In this video, is it a good idea for you to fit an aftermarket automatic transmission oil cooler to your fine four-wheel drive wanking chariot out there on the road towing the shitwa to Dingo Piss Creek? If yes, should that cooler be an air-type cooler or water-based? Details next. I'm John Cadogan from AutoExpert.com.au and I get new cars. <laughs> Cheap, I do. Australia only do, sorry, if you're from, you know, their website. Card. Now, I've got this missive here, it's quite the lengthy time. <laughs> I think you'd agree. From Big Vic from BV. He can get it moaning, he can get it boning, dude. He can get it practicing the kinds of let's call it uh, animal husbandry, that might just get you arrested in some jurisdictions, but not, uh, you know, Queensland. So, Big Vic says, Hi, John, a couple of years ago, I hired a 2.3 tonne caravan and towed it with me five-cylinder BT-50 to Dingo Piss Creek. <laughs> when I went north of Longreach, higher ambient temperature, the radiator temp would redline if I went over 80 k's an hour. And your transmission would also kick back a gear. <gasps> Jesus Christ, next stop, dogs and cats living together, Vic. So, I drove at 75 k's an hour, all good. Chatting on the two-way, which is basically how I would do my research into advanced thermofluids. I'll just get on the UHF and see if some other... Beard stroke and you more than me. Got on the two way, indicated this could be fixed by installing an air cooled transmission oil cooler. Yes. I did this and the problem went away. Why the fuck would a body cooler transmission with hot radiator water in Oz? Because it's not that hot, dude. Like, the transmission oil's at about, I don't know, 110 degrees C or something, and the bottom tank of the radiator's probably at 80. So, relatively speaking, it's not that hot, and Newton's law of cooling, dude. Heat flows from a hot thing to a cold thing, relatively speaking, so there's that. I'm now driving a 2021 Hilux dual cab. Yes! Even better! Resale value's pretty strong, though. Because I was unfortunately T-boned by a P-plater. I see the Hilux transmission's also cooled by what radiator water. Doesn't sound right, does it? Actually, dude, it's okay. We'll get into that. We'll do the beer garden physics of that if you'd like. Uh, I've just... Oh, sorry. I'm him now. <laughs> I'm just boned up for a camp, no, camper trailer, 1.9 tonnes aggregate trailer mass, and no thunder box fitted. Letting the team down there, BV. What's your effluent going to say when you leave it behind? You're seeing all the hot spots, literally, and your effluent is stuck at home or stuck in some friggin' long drop, even worse. <sighs> the Hilux has been fully fitted out with all the off-road fruit. Off, oh, of course. I was hoping you could advise if I should fit an air transmission oil cooler. Maybe the transmission oil needs to be at a certain hot temperature for efficiency. Is it possible to overcool and therefore damage your transmission by fitting an aftermarket cooler? Cheers from God's own country. God's own... What's Vic doing in France? Anywho, let's think about all of this, shall we? So we hire this chitois with the BT before the P-plater took it out. And it overheats when you go over 80 towing the caravan. And presumably the BT was the full bloody ARB pimp special as well and it probably had a bull bar and a winch and dirty big driving lights and all that other crap that you stick on the front end so that you can be part of Club Bogan, okay? And I'd suggest that the over-temp on the engine coolant is probably as a result of poor maintenance or occluded airflow or, you know, things like the radiator being full of grass seeds and all of that crap that happens in the outback. Grasshoppers, grass seeds, grass anything. Grass will burn your friggin' vehicle to the ground if you're not careful out there. That's before you get bitten by a snake or attacked by a cassowary. That's for you Canadians, right? So, 
the fix for your engine coolant over temp is not to fit a cooler for the transmission oil, right? It's to fix the fundamental problem, whatever it is, with the radiator and the cooling system for the engine, I'd suggest. Anywho, this band-aid of fitting an oil cooler might help, but I'd also suggest, and this was something that Big Vic did ask actually, is you want to be careful about cooling the transmission down too much because like all other oil, engine oil for example, engine oil at room temperature is kind of a problem. It doesn't do its job very well and that's why it needs to be chemically modified so it can be thin at low temperatures and maintain reasonable viscosity and uh, thin film toughness at operating temperature, right? Like this is a chemical engineering challenge, dudes. And I'd suggest that transmissions, the optimal temperature for a automatic transmission fluid is probably in that region of about 90 to 95 degrees C. And what you'll notice with most automatics is that you get in the car, it's cold, you drive off, and the shift quality is a bit rough, isn't it? Right, And then the transmission oil gets up to temperature and the shifts get better, right? And this is because the oil is at its optimal temperature, which means it delivers its optimal operating properties. That makes sense. So there is a risk that you can cure the problem north of Longreach, where the ambient temperatures are 40-something in summer, right? But that could also be too effective when you're touring in the snowy mountains during the snow season because the cooling for the transmission could be much greater than you need and it's delivering oil back in there that is much lower than 95C because the ambient temperature outside is, I don't know, minus four or something, okay? So you've got to be careful and when you modify a car, particularly when you modify something with far-reaching potential negative effects, meaning expensive negative effects, like a transmission is not going to be cheap, is it, if you kill one prematurely. And if you modify your car like that and it dies prematurely, even under warranty, they're going to take one look at it and they're going to go, no can do, dude, you've modified that car and that's what fucked it. So there's that. But I want to talk to you about the difference between air and oil in water, like oil going through a pipe in the bottom radiator tank. And I get that it does seem counterintuitively like a poor idea to do that, but there are profound differences between water as a cooling sort of heat exchange medium and air as the same kind of heat exchange medium. And doing the research on the two-way with other beard strokers is probably not the right way to get a balanced view on what the best approach might actually be. There is, of course, an entire mechanical engineering theme park slash torture chamber which revolves around the subject of thermofluids. And you need to know that crap if you want to design a heat exchanger. And heat exchangers are a really good thing to do because a lot of industrial processes and domestic processes generate waste heat. And if you don't dispose of that heat effectively, something is going to go Chernobyl right in your face one day. So kind of important to get these details right. And it gets complex fast and we're not going to go over the laws of thermodynamics and all of that shit. But there are a few kind of basic concepts that you're going to have to know if you want to be across the physics of cooling shit down effectively. The first thing is there's a couple of really convenient fluids, aren't there? There's air and there's water. We've got them copiously available everywhere in society, right? So they've got different properties. And the first one is their weight per unit volume, if you like, okay? 1.3 kilos for every cubic meter for air and 1,000 kilos for every cubic meter for water, which is, of course, why water sinks to the bottom of air. Look at the ocean, sky on top, water below. That's how that rolls. That would be why. Okay, and then there's this other thing which is a little bit more difficult to bend your brain around, but you can do it, dude. It's called the specific heat capacity. It's like how much heat does it take to take one kilo of something and raise it up by one degree C in temperature? And you've got to lose this notion that heat and temperature are the same thing. They're not. 
Heat is energy, and you don't have to use kilojoules. You can use British thermal units or foot-pounds or kilowatt hours, but we're going to use kilojoules because SI. We're going to use kilos because SI. And we're going to use K, which is like absolute temperature, which is sort of the same thing as degrees C, just with the zero at a different spot, down there at minus 273 degrees C, okay? Same steps, different zero, okay? It takes one kilojoule of heat energy to raise one kilogram of air by one degree C. Whereas with water, it's substantially different. It's 4.18 kilojoules to get one kilo, like one liter of water, and raise it up by one degree C. So they're substantially different. And when you're talking about putting them in a box, you've got to come to grips with the fact that one kilo of air takes up about a thousand liters, a little bit less, but one kilo of water is just in a box about that big, right? Because it's only one liter. So one liter of air can absorb 1.3 joules for every degree that it raises up in temperature. Whereas one liter of water can absorb 4.2 thousand joules, right? For every degree C that it increases in temperature. And the obvious conclusion to be drawn by all of this, and you can bend your brain checking my mathematics later if you want, but it's on the money. Water is 3,215 times better at absorbing heat per unit volume. So if you get a litre of water and a litre of air, a litre of water can absorb roughly 3,000 times more heat more easily, if you like, okay? compared with air. And this is, of course, why we moved away from air-cooled cars in the 1960s, thanks to, you know, Adolf Hitler's brilliant idea with the people's car, and we moved to water-based cooling system because a small amount of water can carry a shit ton of heat out of an engine and into a radiator where it's not really a radiator, it's a convective cooler, but it rejects heat into the airflow going through the core. Okay, water is a fantastic medium for the transport of heat from here to there because you don't have to move very much volume of water to move a shit ton of heat. So let's think about what we've just learned in the context of automatic transmission fluid. And let's do a thought experiment where we've got a kilo of automatic transmission fluid hovering in space, just sitting there so we can study it. Right, its specific heat is 1.7 kilojoules per kilo per degree C, which is between air and water, okay? So not as effective per kilo as water at moving heat, but hey, it's in the transmission and it's hot, so we need to move it somewhere and take the heat out of it to reduce the energy content of that oil and thereby drop its temperature, okay? And let's say that our hovering blob of oil is at 110 degrees C and we need to take it down to 95 because 95 is the optimal temperature for those smooth shifts and the uh, low sorts of mechanical wear and things of that nature that you want for your transmission if you want it to be durable under load for a long time, okay? So let's think about that. We've got one kilo and we're gonna reduce its temperature by 15 degrees C and that's how much it takes to do that. So we'll multiply it by 1.7. So our hovering blob of oil that's too hot at the moment, but we're about to cool it down, needs to reject 25.5 kilojoules of energy into some other medium and just fuck it off nicely so that it can be at the right temperature for those optimal shifts and optimal durability of the transmission, right? If we had three litres of water just loitering with intent and it was at 80 degrees C, which is not unlike the temperature of water in the bottom tank of a radiator, comes in the top, right, hot, goes through the core, rejects heat into the air, gets cooler in the bottom tank, okay? So let's say it's at 80 in the bottom tank, all right? Those three litres are gonna be able to accept, you know, 12.54, which is three lots of 4.18 kilojoules, okay, per degree C. So all it's going to take is a two degree change in temperature for the bottom tank of the radiator, those three litres of water in the bottom tank, okay? And that will absorb all of that heat in our one litre of oil, 
And, you know, we're just using it like as an abstract. It's not flowing at the moment. We're not going to think about the flow rates and all of that stuff and the actual areas of and surface areas of pipes and tubes and heat exchangers and shit like that because that's too complex. We're just going to think about taking 25.5 kilojoules of waste heat in the oil, pumping it into three litres of water, and it's going to go up by two degrees C, which is not all that much, okay? So it's gonna go from 80 to 82 degrees C and it will suck all of this temperature out of the oil and the oil's gonna be good to go back in and deliver the smooth shifts that we want. Whereas if you do this with air, if you go oil to air by convection via a radiator, which is really a convective cooler, like a separate oil cooler hanging out the front in the airstream, okay? And if we said that there's going to be like a delta T of 10 degrees C across that convective radiator, okay, then we're going to have air that's at long reach at maybe 40 degrees C ambient temperature, so it's a hot day, and it might go up by 10 degrees C through the core of the cooler, the oil cooler, while it's accepting that heat. You've got to have a temperature rise of the air while it's accepting the heat. And in order to do that, okay, we're going to need to magic up 2.55 kilos of air to do that. And it'll go up by 10 degrees C, not two, but we don't care because we're just chucking it away. It's just gonna hit the car behind us or you know, hit the caravan and then hit the car behind us kind of thing, right? So the problem with 2.55 kilos of air is how much space it occupies, right? You're gonna have to figure out a way of jamming three and a half, let's call it 3,300, but let's call it three and a half cubic metres of air through whatever heat exchanger you design, okay, to take the same heat that we can just tip into three litres of water at the bottom of a radiator tank for a minimum sort of inconsequential rise in its temperature. And this, of course, is why the cooler in the bottom of the radiator tank makes real sense the other thing is, if you're slogging along slowly uphill in a four-wheel driving situations, say, driving in sand, okay, so you're going up a dune, the whole thing's working really hard, you're not necessarily towing something, but sand is like driving up a 45-degree ramp continuously that's just falling apart underneath you the whole time. And if you're in a tailwind, there can be zero airflow through your exchanger here. So at that time, its capacity to do the cooling voodoo that you need it to do, we're going from forced convection, which we've designed it for, like hanging out in the airstream at 100 k's an hour, and we've basically put it in a stagnant piece of air, which is not flowing, okay? And that's a big difference, right? Like the difference is, if there's no airflow and you get saturated by, I don't know, you're bushwalking, let's say, and it pisses down with rain and there's no airflow afterwards, you're not going to be too cold. But if there's a gale blowing at the same time, you get saturated. That can be life and death, dude. And the difference is convective cooling, like forced convection versus sort of stagnant, just basic convection. If there's no airflow, you might be okay. But if there's airflow, you're fucked. Okay, And this, of course, is why we've still got fur and why dogs have got fur and why birds have got friggin' feathers, even the ones that don't fly, right? It's to trap a layer of air around you to reduce convective heat loss in these life or death situations. It's also why you can be in air at zero degrees C wearing a T-shirt, you'll feel cold, let's say the wind's not blowing, but if you're in water, in the same, at the same temperature, let's say one degree C, both cases, okay, so we don't want it to freeze around you, let's say it's just one degree C, air versus water, you're in it, okay, and it's not flowing, you're screwed in the water because the water can absorb so much more heat without really changing its temperature at all around you, and that will kill you quickly, right, that's why water at even five or six or seven degrees C is life or death if you're stuck in it okay, for a long period of time. So the speed dependency of this air sort of oil cooling thing that you design, meaning the airflow dependency, is going to be quite significant. And the other thing about feeding the oil into a bottom tank that's always at sort of 80 degrees C, because there's always a thermostat 
working in your cooling system, your engine cooling system, and that means the bottom tank is going to be reasonably warm, and that reduces the likelihood that you're going to tip oil back into the transmission, which is too cool for optimal durability and optimal shift quality. So for all these reasons, I'd suggest that it's not a dud idea to have an oil cooler in the bottom tank of a radiator. It's just that the radiator itself, like the engine cooling radiator, has to have the robust design built around it so that it can accept the heat that the transmission needs to reject as well as the heat that the engine needs to reject in the most demanding conditions like outback Schittsville, middle of summer or Dubai out on the sand dunes or something, right? So the design of the engine cooling system has to be able to cope with that. And then you, dude, you have to not fuck it up by occluding the airflow with all of that ARB shit up the front, like the worn winch that you never use and the driving lights that really don't help very much in most situations. And you know, anything else that you might bolt on the front that stops enough forced convection happening in the radiator and thereby screws your ability not only to cool the engine, but also to cool the transmission. And this is why my core message is always do not modify your vehicle in any way unless there's a demonstrable design deficiency that you need to overcome so that that vehicle can do the shit that you need it to do. If you're just bolting crap on to join Club Blue Singlet and keep the directors of ARB in their multi-million dollar lifestyles, then, dude, we're on different pages with that. 